Okay, Andrew, I do believe we are now live for this week's show, which is um, which is late. It's always late. Um, and I think that was my fault because I rescheduled. Uh, it is the end of July, a remarkable month, July 2020. Many, many historians will be writing about 2020 as a transitional month, as a month where everything changed. Um, and I think in some ways your newsletter this week, Keith, uh, reflects that. Uh, you lead with uh, your friend, uh, Paul Graham, another grenade of a piece which he's thrown out into the world, f the four quadrants of conformism. Uh, why did you lead with this, Keith, this week? What's the big deal about Graham's four quadrants of conformism? Well, two reasons. One is I was mean about him last week when I was talking about Y Combinator. And I realized afterwards, he, he is one of the loudest and most important voices in explaining why cancel culture might not be the smartest way to deal with things you disagree with. And this essay, which um, he published this week, you know, is a very interesting take where he, he, um, he compares cancel culture to the end of intellectual curiosity and questioning, um, fear of the other, if you like, dominating interest in understanding the other. And he describes conformism as the process of everyone getting behind the, you know, the, the established uh, point of view and not questioning it. And his thought is that the established point of view is increasingly becoming cancel culture. So it's a longish essay. It's very thoughtful. It's well argued. And um, immediately for me, given my age and my education, it, it began to sound like the Enlightenment thinkers who made similar points about religious orthodoxy back in the day. And um, and so I thought it was worth highlighting, putting at the top, and applauding him as well. A couple of thoughts on this. Firstly, when you say he's one of the leading voices, you mean within Silicon Valley? Because I don't think anyone outside Silicon Valley reads Graham. Yeah, I do mean within Silicon Valley. Um, and, and even more narrowly, within Twitter in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Which right. may be a smaller audience. Yeah, I read the piece. I have to admit that... Um, I I wasn't comfortable with it. I, I think the thing that particularly troubled me was this idea that conformism is somehow relative. So his, I, I think the most controversial piece is he argues that today uh, the conformist position, as you say, is to be very open-minded and perhaps aggressively open-minded about race. But the same people today who are in favor of quote-unquote cancel culture, which I'm not sure is a concept I actually even believe in, exists. I think it's a construction of people like Graham. Um, but the idea that the equivalent of the aggressive students in the, the cancel culture movement of the of, in 2020 would have been people in favor of slavery in the middle of the, the 19th century. Um, is that a fair observation? I mean, you may not agree with what I'm saying. Is that what he's arguing, right? I think, I, I don't think he's that crude. I, th I, I, I think it is important, and you're really making this point, to trace the origins of what is called, fairly or unfairly, cancel culture. And I think the origins go back to when you and me were in university. I, I was part of something called counterculture. And counterculture was uh, we, we organized an alternative curriculum at our university and encouraged students to attend our unofficial lectures as opposed to the official lectures. And shortly after counter, uh, counterculture, became the emergence of women's rights, gay rights, were all part of that. And that evolved into something you could think of today as identity politics. Now, identity politics is the championing of difference, which, of course, is a good thing. And the, the hostility to racism, sexism, homophobia, which are also good things. So at the core of um, what is called can cancel culture are people who desire everybody to be equal and treated fairly. 
So in, so in that sense, the spirit behind it is to be championed. What's happened is, as identity politics has grown stronger, it's trying to, it, it has tended to want to use its power to close down its opponents as opposed to debate with them. And that, that in a sense, is taking um, the oppressed, taking on the mantle of the oppressor, um, crossing the line, if you like, from the powerless to the powerful. And all Paul Graham's really saying is that's not smart because the oppressed are going to be the victims of any societal attempt to close ideas down. And so to adopt those methods is self-defeating. And, and I think that's a fair point, uh, Andrew. Even, uh, even well, but let, let's come back to, uh, I mean, you're saying that Graham didn't say anything quite as crude. He did. He said, I'm quoting him in the piece. He, he quotes this Princeton professor, Robert George, who's also extremely controversial. And then uh, Graham says, um, uh, uh, He's too polite to say so. He's talking about Gray, uh, George. But of course they wouldn't. And indeed, our default assumption should, be should not merely be that his students would on average have behaved the same way people did at the time, i.e. with slavery. But, and he's, uh, George is talking about his contemporary students now at, at Princeton. On average have behaved the same way people did at the time, but that the ones who are aggressively conventionally minded today would have been aggressively conventional minded then too. In other words, and this, he says it clearly, this is, this is your friend, uh, Paul Graham. In other words, that they'd have not only fought against slavery, but that they would have been amongst its staunchest defenders. So what he's saying is that today's so-called council culture, these people who are aggressively, particularly at uni you know, elite universities like Princeton, aggressively in favor of identitarian politics and close people down, who, who are in any way suspect, would have indeed been supporters of slavery, which to me is a pretty outrageous thing to say. I mean, you, you don't believe that, right? No, no, I don't believe that. Um, so he is saying it. I mean, there's no two ways about it. You can't defend him here. I, 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 you know, you got to remember the, the newsletter, by the way, is a long piece from Roger McNamee, who I <laughs> strongly... Now you're changing the subject, well, Keith. No, let's, no, let's focus on... Uh, no, no, on, just, on, on uh, what's his name? I just Graham. want to make the point that when I put something in the newsletter... No, I'm not blaming you. I'm not, this is no, not I'm a... This it is, doesn't mean I agree with it. So you're no, yeah, so my, my, my point, I, look, I'm all in favor of, of, of you quoting Graham. It's absolutely great. I'm, I'm hopefully an open-minded person myself. I'm not in favor of shutting Graham down. But what I am saying is that that's exactly what he's saying. And, and it may even be even more reason for you to make this a, um, uh, a piece of the week because it's exactly this kind of argument which outrages the kids at Princeton and will actually call for the cancelling of, of people like uh, Graham. I, I, I think he's trying to stir up those people with rhetorical flourishes that, dis that are not the primary point there is something really good in this essay and what's really which good is what it, yeah go on it, what's really good in it is the call for open debate and confrontation and and um not being scared of being offended uh, to the point where you don't want to hear the other side's argument that's really at the core of it. Now, some of his rhetorical flourishes, as, as you're quoting, <laughs> you know, take the point <laughs> uh, to, to a silly place. But that's well, often, an offensive place, I think, for some yeah, people. Yeah, and th that's often the case with polemic. I mean, he's being polemical. And I think, you know, uh, I don't want to be polemical, but I do want to say that um, it is increasingly the, the conformist point of view to close down, especially right-wing opinion, opinion that smells of racism or sexism or homophobia, yeah. not to argue with it, but to close it down. And I don't think that's good, and I agree with him that it would be uh, better. And we we'll all agree, and we, we certainly d we're not closing anything down on our show. That was the week, Keith. Uh, just, just very briefly, on the four quadrants of conformism, where do you situate yourself and myself? So we can have... Uh, 
upper left going counterclockwise, aggressively conventionally minded, passively conventionally minded, passively independently minded, and aggressively independently minded. Where are you and where am I? I'm definitely aggressively independently minded. And I'd say if there's anything to the top left of me, you're there. <laughs> you mean I'm even more aggressively independently minded than you? Yeah, you are. Um, <laughs> look at your publishing history and the issues you've taken on. And what about Paul Graham? He's in that same place. He's definitely in that place. And Mike Arrington and the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I think, isn't it called A-type personalities? No, yeah, well, I hope so. Uh, anyway, uh, let's move on. I don't want to, you know, it's, it's, everyone should read it. I mean, as you say, I think it's fair to say Paul is a, a smart guy and he's a brave guy in his own way. He's willing to put his opinions out there. I think a lot of people have, w would agree with him, but they're not quite as willing to put their, stick their neck over the parapet. Um, and, and the other piece which connects with this in your uh, reads of the week is cancelling the opinions of those you don't agree with is a slippery slope. Here's a better option by uh, Robert Glazer, an entrepreneur. Um, so what's Glazer saying that's interesting that perhaps um, adds to, uh, add to the Graham piece, Keith? So firstly, let's just remember who Rob Glazer is. Um, he was the founder of Real Networks. Right. Um, which was uh, what we're doing today, streaming. Keith, of, no, you got that one wrong. Oh, it's a different Rob Glazer. So do you want to start this? <laughs> uh, no, no, we can, we can acknowledge We can edit that, this out. Uh, we can acknowledge that I call it. Well, if, if it is, a, yeah, it's because Rob, 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 Robert, Rob Glazer calls himself Rob Glazer. I actually follow him on Twitter and he's a really smart, quick speaking guy. But Robert Glazer is a contributor and uh, he's a much younger man, white male. So I think uh, Robert Glazer and Rob Glazer are two quite different characters. Just for what it's worth, I would have put this in no matter which Robert Glazer. It so was. don't be offended, Robert Glazer. You're, you're even more important in Keith's mind than Rob Glazer. So what's Robert Glazer saying, Keith, that's interesting? He, he's basically, you know, if you read the, the bold headlines that are at the top of his paragraphs or his sections, invite dissent, embrace dissonance, don't waste your energy. Um, and he's basically saying that uh, ideas are a marketplace. Uh, we all operate in that marketplace. And the, the end result of, um, of that marketplace is the world we live in. And so uh, you, you absolutely don't want to uh, restrict the marketplace to only one set of products. Otherwise, you don't get a, uh, the human race doesn't get invested in the next phase of its, of its own life if you do that. So he's pretty consistent with Paul Graham in his point of view. Um, now, he, in doing that, he does acknowledge we all have core values and they're non-negotiable and they're different. So it, it is that non-negotiable core value difference that makes up the human race. And, and by the way, any software platform we all live on. So he's basically asking us all to relax and recognize ourselves collectively in, in what exists, which is um, interesting in the light of the, everything that happened in Congress this week with these four CEOs being called up. Right, and Silicon Valley increasingly being under f fire on lots of different fronts. Maybe that's something we, we talked about that before, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again in the future. Uh, your tweet of the week, though, was a little bit more cheerful, and it, and it reflects the fact that Silicon Valley is doing – it's always – easy to pile in on Silicon Valley and claim everything it's doing is sexist and racist and unfair. But your tweet of the week um, is uh, reflects at least one good piece of news. It's from Mac, the VC, uh, who says, I just got a full scholarship for VC University Online presented by Startup at Berkeley Law, the National Venture Capital Association and Venture Forward. I'm about to have VC training certificate from both Stanford and Berkeley. 2020 is about to be my breakout year. Uh, uh, hashtag VC, hashtag startup. Why is that your tweet of the week, Keith? So the first thing is I, I actually had a Zoom call with Mac about three weeks ago, which was one of maybe a thousand Zoom calls he's been doing. Mm. And what I learned is that he was um, he was – venture investing on behalf of the 
of, of um, part of the city, I think, in Philadelphia, uh, doing seed rounds in Philadelphia. Um, he's he's African American. He's um, he's spent the last month going from a very small number of Twitter followers to ten thousand as of a few days ago, and he's been on a mission to transform himself from uh, a guy working for the city to uh, uh, an independent investor. And his tweet streams have been incredibly insightful. And now he announces that people have noticed and he's got this scholarship. He's a young guy, by the way. I'm just about to follow him, by the way, on Twitter. You've convinced yeah. me. Here and I just thought, what a, what, what a fantastic piece of evidence that effort that you put in to progress for yourself pays off if you're consistent, work hard, smart. Um, he's just a great example to any entrepreneur who has a goal, how to pursue it. And um, it just felt really good to see that. Well, that's great news. And uh, we haven't given up yet on Silicon Valley um, or on... Um or on America, for that matter. Uh, finally, Keith, you, you, you serve up a really, ch and I use this word carefully, ch chunky piece by Chunka Mui. Six laws of zero will shape our future. For the better or worse, it's up to us. Uh, what are these six laws of zero? And I wonder whether we might include a seventh, which is opinion, but what are the six laws? Well, uh, the six laws refers to something that a very well-known guy called Alan Kay was involved in over a long period of time. But it's basically to do with automation leading to key elements of human existence um, being free. And um, the, the, it isn't so much six laws as six things which will become free. The first is computing, which is subject to Moore's law. The second is communications. We're doing what we're doing now more or less for free. Information becomes free. Energy becomes free as we move to wind and sun and so on. Water becomes free. And transportation becomes free. Now, if all of that is true with automation and innovation, that means life becomes free, largely. And things like universal basic income and joblessness. Mm. It's what Albert uh, Wenger, our friend, calls uh, life after capital. Exactly, exactly right. So um, now if you put together Chunk and Mui's piece about the economics of, of life tending towards free with Paul Graham and other stuff about acceptance of difference, open discourse, disagreement, being relaxed with being offended. Those two things are exactly what the Enlightenment was founded on before industrialization. Um, the core of it was innovation and uh, a move away from religion, believing in human beings and uh, society getting better and better and better through progress. Um, San Simone, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and the, the, the uh, architects of democracy uh, all, were, all came about in an era where those were the key tenets. And it feels as if they still need to be, which is why I put them together and I called the newsletter this week, Enlightenment Anybody? Question mark. Yeah, and this is a longer conversation as well, Keith, and, and you bring me on to be obnoxious, uh, so I'm going to be really obnoxious. I mean, this is kind of absurd. On the when you're, It's like Silicon Valley's fair, fairy tales. Um, the idea that six drivers of human progress, water, transportation, energy, we're on the verge of an environmental apocalypse. Haven't you read about that? I mean, okay, it's debatable whether it's an apocalypse or just terrible global warming. But this notion that all this stuff is free, we've heard this crap before. We heard it about computing. And look what happened. Now we have trillion-dollar computing companies. There's nothing free about that. We heard it with surveillance capitalism, and we're all paying for this stuff with our data. So, 
I, I just don't buy this. It's just stupid. Well, it, it isn't stupid, but I accept that you don't buy it. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it is, um, and, and, and you're not stupid either because... The yeah, maybe, maybe I'm saying stupid is unfair. It, it's just r ridiculously optimistic. It's, well, I think it's important when you're talking about the long term, and he's talking about 2050, it's important to understand direction and um, probabilism. Now, uh, he, he, by the way, is a great believer in solving environmental disaster through um, sustainable energy is, is a big part of it. But so water, like but, I mean, just, that. just use one of these. I mean, we're on the verge of water wars. There's not, what's, where's, you know, however, no brilliant technologist is going to invent solutions to the scarcity of water, especially with global warming. Where is, where's he going to, where, when's water going to be? Well, his, his point is that, um, by 2050, and he's talking about 2050, and I'll read the quote, anyone near a body of salt water can benefit from water technology okay. breakthroughs. And he makes the point that desalination, which has always been a promise, yeah. is now getting to be real. In the same way that, you know, I've got solar energy on my roof now, and for the last eight months, I haven't paid anything for electricity. Now, it did cost me $25,000 to get to that starting point, but... Does anyone believe that by 2050, those solar panels won't be close to free? They probably will be. Um, so I, I, think, I think he's not crazy. Uh, he is very much thinking, you know, long term, 30 years. Um, and that's the same time period that joblessness will grow to billions. So it, it, it's an important conversation. All right. And it's Albert's argument about a, a world after capital, which... Um drives him to argue, you know, to be close to Andy Yang and argue in favor of guaranteed minimum income and all the rest of it. So uh, the, the, the one area, I mean, okay, I accept I maybe overreacted a little bit, but we've heard this argument about computing being free, and I just don't buy it. Excusing the pun, I don't buy it. I mean, computing is, in some senses, relatively free. You and I are doing this for free, but someone's getting very rich out of it. Whether it's um, my our, our our providers, or whether it's Google or Twitter or YouTube or wherever else we're broadcasting this, the idea of free, I think, is a delusion. Well, I think let's let's separate who gets rich from what it costs, because I think you're right that people are getting rich, and I think that's a separate conversation about ownership. What is ownership? you know, 50 years from now when there is automation. And, and you and I probably align a lot around the problem of discussing that. But at the point of view of what you spend, you know, Apple this week announced that if you have an Apple card, you can get an iPhone now on a monthly plan, which was about $50 a month, I think. Yeah. Um, so the trend is that the relationship between cost and computing power are moving in the direction of each unit of computing power getting closer and closer to zero and massive power being put in the hands of people. And that that's real and that's true. So the trend towards free doesn't mean no one makes money because Apple owns the iPhone and you buy it from them. But it does mean for you and me, we can do things that CNN only could do. Now TV. Exactly. And, and, and so um, the cost of entry into very profound technologies is getting close to free um and my newsletter i don't get paid for doing it well you're trying to be paid don't aren't you charging as well i give it away for free for the most part you can choose to pay me as an act of good faith if you want to <laughs> but um you don't have to well here's how i said we, we got to go now keith but here's my suggestion is that we uh this show will certainly run and run and run and in 2050 we will in july of 2050 uh, we will have a show about whether or not computing, communications, information, energy, water, and transportation have all become free. And I will bet my Diet Coke, my empty can of Diet Coke today, that it won't be free. That's known as a long bet. And the sad <laughs> news is that in, 19, in 2050, I will be 96 years 
old and therefore probably not a, not around to collect money. Well, he didn't say life. Actually, he didn't. What, what he didn't do was sort of add the, 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 the Telian little seduction that we'll all live forever too. So maybe that will be the seventh key driver. But anyway, I hope we'll, we'll still be arrived. Uh, we'll still be alive next week, Keith. For this was the week. Thank you for a wonderful conversation and some really stimulating, provocative links and tweets, as you always do. Thank you, Andrew. See you next week. <laughs>